including President Trump putting Iran on notice. Coming up, we will tell you what this new threat is all about. Also, there was a deadly mass shooting in Canada where more than a dozen people were shot, including a young girl. We're going to take you live to Toronto to get the very latest on that story. But first, let's take a look at some of the other headlines making your news right now. The Ferguson fire in California continues to grow as it inches closer to Yosemite National Park. So far, 42 square miles have burned, although no buildings are said to be destroyed. High temperatures have persisted for more than a week in Japan, killing more than 40 people. Today, the temperature hit 106 degrees, the highest ever recorded in the country. Hundreds of Uber and Lyft passengers live streamed without their knowledge. It apparently happened to riders in the St. Louis area who rode in Jason Gargak's car while he was driving for the two companies. In statements, both Uber and Lyft say they have suspended Gargak, who had been quoted as saying he just wanted to capture his interactions with passengers. The U.S. Coast Guard has suspended the search for missing sailor John Santorelli in Lake Michigan. Officials say he was taking part in the Chicago yacht race to Mackinac Saturday when he fell overboard and slipped under the water. The New Jersey company that makes Ritz says the crackers contain whey powder, which they believe could be contaminated. So far, no reports of anyone getting sick. Parents take note. A new study in the American Academy of Pediatrics finds that some food additives and even the packaging can pose health risks. The study says chemicals in cardboard food packaging and nitrates and processed meat can hurt a kid's developing immune system and increase the risk of childhood obesity. The next Mega Millions drawing is tomorrow night as the estimated jackpot has grown to $493 million. All right, let's get started here with President Trump back on Twitter, launching a new attack on Iran. For more on this, we're going to check in with our Karen Travers, who is standing by at the White House. Now, he's warning Iran to never threaten the U.S. again. Karen, where is this coming from? Hi, Liz. This was an all-caps tweet very late Sunday night after the president came back from a weekend at his golf club in New Jersey, tweeting this from the White House. Again, it was an all-caps tweet where the president says if Iran threatens the United States, they will, quote, suffer consequences the like of which few throughout history have ever suffered before. Liz, the White House defending this tweet, saying that this is the president showing peace through strength and that if anybody is inciting anything between the U.S. and Iran, it's the Iranians. This all comes after the president of Iran, Rouhani, on Sunday uh, said that if the United States pokes or antagonizes Iran, that there would be the mother of all wars. You also, Liz, had the secretary of state over the weekend, Mike Pompeo, saying that Irani the Iranian regime engaged in corruption and human rights abuses. But at the same time, Secretary Pompeo said there was a possibility there could be direct talks, engagement between the Trump administration and the Iranian regime. But Liz, he also said that regime engages in what he called mafia-like behavior. Well, Karen, this of course is happening months after the U.S. withdrew from the Iran nuclear deal and Iran facing new sanctions. What does this, if anything, have anything to do with those mm -hmm. situations. More tough talk again from the Trump administration, as you're right, they're considering those sanctions. And, you know, the president over the weekend, maybe he gave a little bit of a clue as to why he went down this path. He said that he was severely criticized for being too nice to Vladimir Putin, the Russian president last week, when he met with him in Finland. The president said if he had been tough and vicious, he would have been criticized for that too. So I think it's notable that while the president was taking heat last week uh, for being too nice to Putin, he's trying to take this tough stance toward Iran. White House Press Secretary Sarah Sanders today brushed off questions about whether it was an attempt to uh, change the topic, shift the narrative a bit from all of the criticism the president was facing last week about Russia and instead try and, uh, you know, cr create this other story controversy here with Iran. She says, no, the president is focused on many things at the same time and Iran is one of the many issues on his plate right now.
Karen Travers, thank you so much at the White House. Well, we're going to stay in Washington and talk about what else is happening there, including Paul Manafort in court where his trial is about to get underway. And for the latest on this story, we're going to check in with our Mike Levine. Mike, thank you for joining us. Uh, first, talk to us about what we can expect with this trial happening. Well, so Paul Manafort and his lawyers are in court right now, actually, urging a federal judge to do actually delay his trial by a matter of months as they try to mount his defense. We will know probably in a matter of hours whether that trial actually gets delayed. If it doesn't, then starting on Wednesday, we can expect uh, both sides to start picking jurors from the jury pool. You know, they'll, they'll be looking for people that, while I'm sure they'll know about the actual case, can they be uh, unbiased in their decision making? Well, Mike, also making news, of course, former campaign advisor Carter Page and the new documents released about the wiretapping. Talk to us about what's happened in that case and bring us up to date. Yes, yeah, so the FBI this weekend, uh, in sort of a surprise move, released more than 400 pages of documents that were previously uh, high level, uh, top secret. And those documents are basically what the FBI used to get a federal judge to approve covert surveillance of Trump associate Carter Page. Those documents show that that controversial, controversial dossier was just one okay. piece of a much larger okay. mosaic uh, that they used. All right, Mike, last but not least, let's really quickly talk about Russia one more time. President Trump back on Twitter calling it all a hoax. You know, Karen touched upon, you know, is he trying to change the topic from Russia and now talking about Iran? Uh, what is the, the president's stance on Russia and once again calling it all a conspiracy? Well, the, just this past week, actually, some of the nation's top national security advisors were gathered in Aspen, Colorado, and they all said this was not a hoax, this was not a witch hunt, and that Robert Mueller is a straight shooter and that we should just see what happens. Thank you. Michael Levine in D.C. Thank you very much. Okay, now we are going to take you to Canada, where once again a deadly mass shooting ended with at least two people killed and more than a dozen shot. Now, we know that a young girl was shot and the motive, well, we don't know, but we do know that Toronto officials just held a press conference. And so we are going to check in with our uh, CTV reporter, Peter Ackman, who is with our sister station in Canada. Peter, you are there at the scene. Bring us up to date what happened and what do we know about what happened? Well, what we heard uh, around 10 o'clock last night, uh, this is a very busy area, inner city area, very popular restaurants, uh, Greek neighborhood. Uh, so it was a very packed time, uh, lots of people on patios. When uh, reports of gunfire uh, started, uh, one individual uh, reportedly dressed all in black uh, with uh, uh, s s was uh, shooting into restaurants, into doorways, at people walking by. Uh, ended up, as you mentioned, shooting uh, 14 people. Uh, two of them have died, one at the scene. Uh, we're hearing also reports of the 12 injured. There's a, a young child, nine years old, uh, in uh, critical condition. And so this person was uh, just firing off as many shots as he possibly could. We don't know anything other than that he's a 29-year-old male. Uh, what happened at that point is police arrive on scene. Uh, they exchanged gunfire with that individual. He took off. Later, they found him dead on the street. How he died, it seems unclear at this point. Police aren't saying whether it was uh, by their hand or he, whether he killed himself. But he, the shooter is dead. Uh, two other individuals are dead and 12 are in hospital. Uh, the Toronto mayor held a press conference this morning talking about this horrible tragedy. Uh, what did he have to say as far as uh, his reaction to it all? Well, this comes at a very tough time for Toronto. There's a gang war that's been going on. Uh, the Toronto mayor and council rolled out uh, uh, some new uh, re regulations to get more cops on the street. Uh, they put 200 extra police officers this weekend. This is the first weekend. And for this to happen, now he's not linking this to that gang attack, but he is saying that there is a gun problem in this city and in this country. Let's take a listen to what he said. As I've said repeatedly, this is an international problem and this is a domestic problem. There are far too many people carrying around guns in our city and our region who should not have them.
Now, in this situation, you heard him talking about that. He said there is a gun problem. He's going to call on the federal government to tighten gun regulations because he says that currently it allows people to have uh, far too many guns in Canada, uh, despite the tough laws. Uh, and also, there's a lot of guns that there are reportedly coming over the border from the United States and northern states that people are buying and bringing over uh, in order to be used here by uh, gang members and criminals here in Canada. And Peter, you mentioned this happened on a very busy street right now. What I see behind you are police tapes and nothing happening. Obviously closed off right now. How long is this investigation going to be happening? And talk to us about that scene right there for people who might not be familiar with Toronto. Well, this is a very busy area. Normally, this would be crammed with cars and people. It's right near a subway station, a very, very busy time, day and night, especially in the summertime. Lots of patios, lots of things like that. Uh, the Special Investigations Unit is there investigating. Uh, we're, we're hearing reports that the, the body of the shooter is actually still uh, on the street around that corner. Uh, the uh, police are investigating. We're also hearing that, uh, uh, th that they're trying to... I, sort of pinpoint every shot, every step he took down the street, where he turned, who he shot, and everything like that, trying to bring it back to where he began this, uh, what his motives might have been. At this point, they're not saying anything about terror or whether he was linked to any type of group. So that type of information is still needing uh, to be discovered. But normally, this would be a, a very, very busy area. Uh, it's just in the inner city outside of the downtown of Toronto. And so uh, right now, it's cordoned off. It's about four or five blocks that have been completely shut down to the public and they say that they'll be holding it as long as they need to to rebuild exactly what happened to try and uh, you know go through the steps of the gunman and uh, try and figure out a motive. Peter Ackman with CTV once again thank you very much live there in Toronto. Okay now we are going to take you to California where a standoff at a Trader Joe's market ended with one person killed and that suspect is in custody. Our Marcy Gonzalez is in Los Angeles. She has been following this story since it broke. Marcy, where does this investigation stand and what are we learning today? Hi, Elizabeth Wool. That suspect, 28-year-old Gene Atkins, is being held on $2 million bail uh, on suspicion of murder because, as you mentioned, one woman was killed here at the Trader Joe's, a, a manager named Melita Corrado. Uh, it's still unclear whether she was caught in the crossfire in this gun battle with police, possibly shot by police accidentally, or if she was shot by that suspect. So formal charges have not been filed yet. That could happen today. And at that point, uh, we could see the suspect in court as soon as today. But to, to bring you back to the beginning of how all of this began, police say the suspect shot his grandmother Saturday afternoon around 1.30, shot her seven times inside of the home they share. Also, uh, we're told his girlfriend was grazed in the head by a bullet in that exchange. Police say that Atkins then got in his grandmother's car, brought his girlfriend with him, and then took off. Police were chasing him. He was shooting at them through the back window of that vehicle, exchanging gunfire. And that pursuit led here to about 10 miles away, the vehicle crashing into a pole here. And that's when Atkins got out of the car, was still exchanging gunfire with police. And this is where the Trader Joe's is. This is the entrance you can see is boarded up. Uh, just on the other side, there are visible bullet holes. And this parking lot here was packed as that gunfight was happening. People were having to dive for cover. And that's when we're told the gunman went inside of the Trader Joe's. This was a Saturday afternoon. It was packed with shoppers. People were sent running out through the back door. Some of them made it out. We talked to an employee, a 17 year old cashier here, who said she was afraid to run out. So she actually went upstairs with some of her colleagues. They ended up uh, in a bathroom. They barricaded themselves in a stall, three people in one stall because they were afraid that he might shoot through the door. So they were doing their best to hide. There were other people a couple rooms down in the second level, they found a ladder, put that out through the window, 
and managed to climb down. But the mayor says at one point in all of this, there were as many as 50 people who were downstairs here in this Trader Joe's being held hostage. One of those people who was in there says that at one point Atkins threatened to kill everyone, that uh, he sent one of the hostages to go through the aisles and gather anyone else who was hiding so they could all be in one place. Uh, police say that hostage negotiators were in communication with Atkins through this entire thing uh, that he had asked to speak with his grandmother. He made a series of demands. Finally, after about three hours, so around 6.30 in the evening, the final hostages came out with Atkins. Uh, Atkins had requested handcuffs and put them on himself and then came out and surrendered. Uh, so that's the latest here, Liz. Back to you. Marcy. <laughs> Incredible, incredible story, but why also behind yeah. you, I see a what looks like a memorial that the community has set up for the victims. Yeah, uh, I'm sure a lot of community members are coming in, dropping off flowers, and it looks like notes as well. Yeah. Yeah, we'll bring you over here and, and give you a look at it. And, you know, I should also mention that there were several people who were injured in all of this. There were six uh, people who were transported from the scene here, including the suspect, also a 12-year-old boy who was injured uh, inside of the store. Uh, but they were all brought to the hospital in fair condition, so everyone there expected to be okay. And the grandmother who was shot seven times also expected to survive. But, yeah, look at all of these flowers. People have been coming by um, all day yesterday, all morning today, leaving these flowers and these handwritten notes. And some of them are just really so touching. Uh, this one to our Trader Joe's community. You are the center of the Silver Lake community. You are Silver Lake. We send you all of our love during this very difficult time. A really personal note here, uh, Melly Mel. Everyone says that, that Melita was, was known as Melly or Mel. And it says, my angel, I will forever miss your laugh and positive attitude. Thank you for being a good friend. I will love you forever. So just uh, people are still coming by leaving notes. There are markers here so that people can leave their sentiments here on this wall outside of this Trader Joe's. Uh, we heard from Melly's brother yesterday. He tweeted saying that the family's doing the best they can to just process this, that they miss her already, that she was loved immensely. And now a part of the investigation is to see whether Melly, who was a manager here, uh, was caught in the crossfire or, again, if she was shot by the suspect. Elizabeth. Marcy Gonzalez live in Los Angeles. Thank you so much for that update. Now, also happening today in Branson, Missouri, authorities will begin recovering the wreckage of that duck boat, that capsized you see there in what was apparently awful, horrible weather conditions. And right now, authorities are looking into what happened and could this have been prevented? Our Marcus Moore is there on the scene. Marcus, thank you for joining us. I see crews are behind you. What's happening right there? Well, uh, Elizabeth, good morning to you. We're right here at Table, Table Rock Lake in uh, Branson, Missouri, and we are getting our first look at the duck boat that was the focus of that, that terrible tragedy on the water last week. The cruise